Can everybody hear me? Yes. All right. By way of quick review, this is also helpful for me. What we talked about last week. We talked about kind of how the Puritans were developing and what their concerns were and the millinery petition. And who, who, who did we end up talking about as king? James. James. This is the famous James of the King James Bible. So uh, the tricky part of what, what I'm navigating through, let me just give you the context here, because hopefully this will all make sense when we pull it together. It's a little bit like when you're watching a movie and there's all the different plots, and it's like there's that moment where they all sort of come together. That's a little bit about what's happening now in the where we are in the historical and the theological development of the church. So as we talked about, James continues the policy in England of... Um, Protestantism, and um, does that along after he's taken over from Elizabeth. Remember, James has come down. He was James the sixth of Scotland. He comes down to become James the first of England. And so there's a long period of time that's been Elizabeth's reign, and then James's reign is actually fairly substantial in length as well. So uh, Scotland had been Protestant since James Knox had brought uh, Calvinist uh, thought, reform thought back to Scotland back in the middle of the 16th century. And um, um, of course, England had become Protestant primarily as the political change, but then ha how that played out, and we've talked about this a lot through, uh, through Mary and then through, through Edward and then Mary and then back to Elizabeth and now, and now to James. What's going on on the continent at the same time, we're going to probably pick this part up next week is that uh, what's going on inside of the Reformed Church is the, the argument is starting to arise over what we think of more today as being Calvinist thought, sort of the five points of Calvinism, and the rise of Arminians, or the uh, Arminius position, in opposition to some or all of that. And so we're looking at these things independently, but they're going on at the same time. And so when we're done looking at them independently, we'll sort of pull them all back together to see how they interact with each other because they definitely do interact with each other. And so a couple of times, again, we're gonna use the same technique we've used over the last couple of weeks, which is using the Ryan Reeves lectures to sort of guide us through with the pauses and the discussions that go around that. You're going to hear him several times make references to what was going on in the Arminian or going on in the Calvinist Arminian debate that's going on at the same time the things that we're going to be looking at today are going on. Does that make any sense? So, yeah, and when you said the Calvin Arminian, where did that sort of originate? Was it in England? It actually makes its way to England, but, but it's mainly the big place that it's going on in the video that we'll look at next week, which will get us into the historical context of that, but then we'll also get us into the theological discussion about it, which is the other important part. Much of that is going on in what we call today as the Netherlands. In fact, oh, okay. what's going on there is referred to sometimes as the Dutch Revolt. And in fact, the, the, the lecture that we're going to use from Ryan Reeves, anybody that wants to look ahead, you're certainly welcome to do so. The links are there on the Sunday School page. It's actually called, it's, <laughs> the Dutch Revolt is in the title of that video because it's a big part of what's going on there. That sets, the, there's a political, like, like in all of this, hopefully you picked up on this theme, there's both a political and a theological thing that all gets intertwined here during this whole period. And so... Most of that discussion is most of that discussion is going on on the continent, but it's going on in the Netherlands. And if you know the geography of um, of Europe, <laughs> uh, the realization that it here's the Netherlands, <laughs> here's England. They're close to each other. There's a lot of trade that's going back and forth. Um, eventually, the Netherlands will break up into what we think of as being the Netherlands today in Belgium. <laughs> 
that actually is the result of a religious element that's going on there. How does Belgium come to be? Well, ultimately it takes till 1830 for it to come to be, but it's because of the fact that there are two strains of, of Protestantism that are found in, um, that are found in, uh, in the Netherlands. And they, they sort of align, in addition to being a Catholic element that produces Belgium, there's also both Calvinist and Arminius thought that's going on inside of the Netherlands. So that keeps finding its way over to England. That's the point, is that while we're talking here about generally about the flow of English history and English Protestantism and the fact that we're, we're in the Puritan period now, uh, the Puritans are various parts of the Puritans. Remember, that's not just one sect of people. Those are different sects are picking up on the, the argument and the debate that's going on about going on between reformed thought, Calvinism, <laughs> and the Arminius response to that, particularly on the topic of predestination. So I make that as clear as really, really, really dirty mud. These things are going on at the same time, and it's hard to, to do a narrative that stays um, going down a timeline where you're not just bouncing back and forth. So I've tried to avoid bouncing back and forth because it's confusing enough without bouncing back and forth about where you are to try to stay in the same wind. But you're going to hear this multiple times as we, we're going to continue on the second part of understanding what happens after James in England. You're going to hear him, hear him make reference to Arminianism. And we haven't really gone deep into that. We'll go deep into that next week, but I think you can get the flow. Generally speaking, the Arminius were those that were inside the Reformed tradition. They are Protestants who are starting to push back on what they view as being some of the more extreme application of Calvin's thought on salvation, particularly on the topic of predestination. There's other things that are at play there, but it primarily is around the topic of predestination. The Calvinist Arminius debate exists inside of Protestantism. That's the, one of the important things to get a good grasp on. This is not something that's being debated among Catholics and Protestants. This is being debated inside of the Protestant movement by different parts of that. So as you recall, what were some of the things that James dealt with as he assumed the, uh, as he assumed the monarchy in England from a, from a religious standpoint? Well, I mean, on his way to being king, that's when that millinery petition came up. So the, the, people in the Anglican church were wanting the, 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 things changed. The, there were Puritans who wanted some things to change. There were others who, yeah, remember he's met on the road. In other words, he's coming down from Scotland to assume the throne in England. He's met on the road and presented this petition that had all these things. You remember last week when we looked at the video, it was over what what games were okay to play or not play on Sunday. And uh, you know, some of the things were what the practice were in worship. Should you have to kneel and do the, do the cross when you entered the, uh, when you entered the sanctuary with all of this type of thing. So this is the backdrop that James gets into. If you remember what was sort of his brilliant way of dealing with this was he pulled them together for a conference and did anybody get everything they wanted? No. And in fact, he then put them on the task of doing what? Working together on the translation of an English Bible. Since the issue is over, you know, interpretation of the Bible, and we talked about sort of how to, you know, how in one way brilliant James was politically in terms of how he dealt with the theological issues here. He's going to be succeeded by his son, Charles, and that's sort of what we're going to pick up today. The, the video will pick up talking about uh, what's leading up into the latter part of James's reign and the Charles's reign. And the fairest thing that I can say about Charles is he ain't James in terms of, of skill and tact and a number of things. You'll see some of that here. And this is eventually going to lead into the English Civil War. In fact, the title of the video that we're looking at today is Around the English Civil War. 
And the English Civil War, again, also has political overtones, but it also has a theological underpinning. And it's also very important because it also sets the backdrop for as we come back and revisit where Baptists break off and where some other breakoffs happen, it's all during this period. So this is really more of that setting of the historical background during this particular period. So does that make sense? Yes. All right, so now I'm gonna come up here and try to uh, make sure I'm sharing sound. And I'm gonna start the video and if somebody will give me a thumbs up uh, once the video starts so that we've got good sound that would be appreciated i'm going to turn on the closed captions i know sometimes they get it wrong but at least they get it right enough to help can you either open the door or turn the air conditioner it's so warm up in here all right we have good audio there in this lecture we're looking at charles the first and the english civil war and to tell the story of the english civil war it's almost impossible to not focus our attention almost entirely on the figure of Charles I. Charles was the son of James I, the man who had come down from Scotland to found the Stuart dynasty over both Scotland and England. And we've noted on a few occasions just how important monarchy was to those living in this day and age. Not everyone agreed with the king. They wanted some checks and balances, but there had not yet arisen in Europe a real robust call for checking and balancing the king's power. There had been some ideas, sure, but none of them had talked about either going to war with the king in the sense of putting him under the boot of those who felt that they had been oppressed by the king, nor had there yet been a real robust call from, say, parliament to stand up to tyranny for the sake of the kingdom. Those of us living in the modern world are more accustomed to seeing a pretty serious separation between the man or the woman holding an office and the office or the institution itself. Let's say in some hypothetical future time, there is a president of the United States who is discovered to have done some awful crime. Well, if he or she is removed from the office, most of us would say that this person has tarnished the office, sure, but putting them under law and putting them on trial for this hypothetical crime would be a very natural thing for us. In this day and age, it's not all that natural. The idea was always there that the king was above law. Not above law in the sense that they could do whatever they wanted in any old case. They had some checks and balances, yes. So, for example, with Parliament, the king had to call Parliament and request funds to go to war. But there had not yet arisen an idea that if the king wanted to change things, say in the church, that he did not have that prerogative. So Charles I is really the man who instigates, or at least creates the culture that gives rise to the English Civil War. And Charles really is a strange figure. At times, he seems to be really religiously indifferent. Trying to determine what his personal religion is, is usually a failed quest. He married a Roman Catholic on purpose. He backed Arminianism on purpose. But in every case, there doesn't seem to be any serious commitment one way or the other in terms of a theological trajectory for Charles. In many cases, his decisions are designed to really stick it to his enemies, and that's just bad leadership. Well, the context of the English Civil War is the wider political religious unrest that had gone on really since the mid 16th century. And we talked about this with the rise of the Small Cultic League and a number of the fights there in Germany, as well as with the Huguenots and the fights in France to define the future of where the French church would go. But there were others. Notably, there was the Dutch Revolt, which we'll look at in a later lecture. All of this really culminates in the Thirty Years' War, from 1618 to 1648, one of the most important and bloodiest series of battles to really come to Europe down until the First World War. So the Thirty Years' War last for 30 years. It's actually one of those things that actually meets its name. For example, the Hundred Years' War lasted for 117 years. But the Thirty Years' War is a religious, is, is a, actually it's a series of wars all contained under the same banner where there are political conflicts, but every single one of these political conflicts has a theological underpinning or a theological overtone. This literally is Europe 
and parts of Europe at war with each other over politics, but those politics are also interlaced with religion. But it's not so the Thirty Years' War is the English Civil War? No, the English Civil War will actually happen towards the end of this. Okay. But this is all happening at the same time. The picture that I want you to draw here to get in your head, what I've been working to get in my head, is there's hardly a place in Europe anywhere where there's not tension or actual breaking out into conflict, be it very local or on a wider basis between various political entities. And those political entities are aligned with something theological. Sometimes this is Protestant versus Catholic, very much what you see in France uh, with the Huguenots and uh, the French crown, where that is, uh, that is France, which is predominantly Catholic, uh, at various points oppressing and fighting against the Huguenots who are adamant Protestants. In Germany, it's among Lutherans and Catholics. In the Netherlands, it's among Catholics and Arminianists and Calvinists. <laughs> in England, the English Civil War ends up being between various sects of the Protestants and still some elements of Catholicism there. So if you get the picture that there's conflict and tension going on everywhere, you've got the right picture. So that's the backdrop for what we're talking about. All of the fights all of the civil wars, all of the turmoil in the 17th century political context. It is not merely politics, though. Every single one of these fights is driven by religious, we might say, fervor. Not extremism by any means. Rather, this is a day and age when Europe had not yet come to the conclusion that they were simply going to have to abide with different faiths living side by side. This was still an age when people thought that they could win by war, and impose their church on top of others. Often what happened is monarchs attempted to tamp down on the infighting within their country. So for example, in France, the Valois family over time did its best to keep a reign, keep a check on the amount of violence going on between Catholics and Protestants. James I, in fact, in England, did much of the same policy. In his world, though, of course, he's not so much dealing with Catholicism, though there were always Catholics remaining in England. Today, we know them as recusant. In covert places where they would not be seen, because increasingly there were laws in the books against, as they called it, recusancy. James, though, wanted a more tolerant policy. The English crown does not want much of this war or the upheaval to come to their territory. And actually in the 1620s, James does his best to end the hostilities where, say, the parliament would want nothing to do with the treaty or any type of partnership with a country that was Catholic. Well, the problem from a political standpoint is if you cut yourself off from doing business with Catholics, you really are limiting yourself. I just want to stop here. Uh, I remember, remember watching this video for the first time. Okay, there's the big blobs that I'm accustomed to, you know, England and France. And then what is this? Uh, you know, the, the, there's the Spanish Netherlands, there's the Dutch Republic. You know, this, this really, I think, brings home pretty well uh, the, um, the, uh, the whole concept about what's going on with... Uh, you know, all these various German principalities and the various things that are inside of that. Uh, it's a very divided, it's a very divided Europe. And particularly when we think about it from the standpoint we know, which is the standpoint of, you know, these larger nation states, modern nation states, all of France, all of Spain, all of England. There is some of that, but, you know, look, for example, still how divided all of Italy is. Italy doesn't really come into being as we know it until the 19th century. And Germany doesn't come into being as we know it until the late part of the 19th century as well. So just think divided. And each one of these colors and areas represents in many cases a slightly different take theologically than either their neighbors. That's the reason they exist in many instances. 
is they're slightly different than their neighbors. Significantly, France and the Holy Roman Empire, Spain, and large parts of the Italian peninsula, and significant parts of all other parts of Europe, and the southern half of the Netherlands, which will eventually become Belgium, are all Catholic. To limit what is possible... Can you all still hear me? Yes. Okay. I was getting a spinning blue circle there, so I was making sure that wasn't that, that Zoom had gone away. Based on religious principles, from a political standpoint, was increasingly problematic. And so at the end of his life, in the 1620s, James brings to Parliament a concern that some of the recusancy laws be relaxed. Parliament will have none of it, though, and they actually double down on the recusancy laws. The context of the Civil War, though, is that just as James was dying, Parliament began to exert itself. Did we lose Don? I think we did. I'm texting. Oh, no. They might still be watching the video and not realizing they're not on. <laughs> well, but all of our pictures and stuff should have disappeared. I know. That's what I was thinking, too. It didn't. It's like it didn't completely just turn Zoom off. No, because we're still here. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Can you hear us? Yes. There he is. All right. Uh, I realized that it had gone away, so I'm back now. So I'm going to back this up a little bit. About how long was I gone? Uh -uh. A couple of minutes. And got to get it back into screen sharing mode. And it was when you were uh, wondering what this area was. You were talking about um, on the map. Okay. It looks like it's still recording. That's the good news. I'll have to go in and do a little editing, but that's not too bad. All right. So I'm going to try to pick this back up and find where I am and <laughs> share the screen. Uh, all right. Can you guys see Charles and the Infanta now on the screen? Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. So going to come back to here. This may be duplication, but better duplication than missing something. OK. The context of the Civil War, though, is that just as James was dying, Parliament began to exert itself and to make overtures as to who they thought the young prince, Prince Charles, ought to marry. They issued ominous claims that he should not marry a Catholic, that he should marry someone who is Protestant. Well, again, the rule of thumb is, as soon as you tell a king what he or she can't do, they're very well going to do the opposite. Charles and James both believed that it was none of Parliament's business to tell him who he ought to marry. And Parliament was clamoring for war with Spain, one of their old Catholic enemies, who had, at the end of Elizabeth's reign, sailed the Armada up in the hopes of attacking and perhaps even taking England. And they had been defeated under Elizabeth, 
but the hostility remained. And Parliament wanted nothing to do with Spain, but there was actually a princess down there, the Infanta, as she is known, who was something of an ideal match for Charles, just in terms of the politics of it. Well, just to give you a little microcosm of the way this is going to work during Charles' reign, Charles doesn't want Parliament to tell him anything of what to do, certainly not who he's going to marry. But he's also a bit gun-shy, you might say. He's a bit unwilling to really stand tall and tell Parliament what he's going to do. So what does Charles do? He secretly <laughs> heads off to Spain to try to find himself a wife. Now it comes to no end that he travels back and no one in England really knows what he had done. He then, however, turns to France and does a similar move. He ends up marrying Henrietta Maria, the French princess and the daughter of Henry IV. And you'll recall that Henry IV, this man who said that Paris is worth a mass, he had converted from Protestantism to Catholicism when he took the throne. Well, again, Charles seems to speak out of both sides of his mouth. In the marriage negotiations with France, he promises to relax the laws against recusancy or against covert Catholic practice in England. He then comes back to Parliament and tells them that he's going to marry Henrietta Maria, but that he's not going to relax these laws. He's also promised the French crown that he will supply English ships in their efforts to secure their borders and their coastal towns. And there's a very famous battle, the taking of La Rochelle. This is a Huguenot town, and the crown did not like that the Huguenots had taken over, and so they were going to bombard it and take it back. Charles had promised ships and fleet to go down there to be at service for the crown, but he knew immediately, as soon as he got back to England, that he had put forward English ships to assault the Huguenots, that there was going to be an uprising, at least metaphorically speaking, significant hostility towards them. And so in the last minute, he sends his own ships down there to protect La Rochelle, and it's to no avail, and it fails. So now he's simultaneously made Parliament and the French king unhappy. Still, though, he marries Henrietta Maria, and to the day he died, no one trusted him religiously for this. So you can already see how Charles is not as bright as his dad. What did he do? He managed to upset everybody. But I don't understand if they want to fight with Spain because they're upset. Why would they want him to marry the Spanish Infanta? Yeah, Spanish princess. This is this is. She's Catholic. Yes. But again, this is this is where this gets sometimes hard to follow because there's the politics of things and then there's the theology of things and they're all in a bag, shaken up and mixed together. So was Henrietta Maria? She was Catholic. Catholic. She was Catholic also. because the French crown is Catholic. Well, you even heard there when Henry the Fourth took the crown. He converted from Protestantism to Catholicism with the famous thing, you know, Paris is worth a mass. Basically, this doesn't matter to me. So, you know, if sitting through a Catholic mass is what I've got to be to be king, I want to be king. So I'll convert. Um, and Henrietta was which, which Henry's descendant? <laughs> uh, he was descended from, yeah, I, I think Kathy <laughs> might have to go back and look. He's descended from... No, Henrietta was whose descendant? She, she's daughter of Henry the Fourth. Daughter of Henry the Fourth, the one I just mentioned there. Who, who's the French Henry the Fourth, not a not an English Henry the Fourth. Right. But remember, there had been the intermarriage between English crown and French crown going back a ways as well. Right. So again, the history here. We're not here for the history of this, except that the history of this ties to all the stuff that's going on. So, for example. Um, the Huguenots are Protestants in France. So when Henry pledges support to the, to the French crown, which is Catholic against the Huguenots, as was just referenced there by Dr. Reeves, who does he upset? English Protestants. Um, and at the same time, he's made promises to the French crown, so now he's going to upset them. To Kathy's point, Spain is very much Catholic. Uh, even hence, you know, what had happened with the Armada, but England had defeated 
the Yamada had failed in the late 16th century, 1588, if I've got the date right in my head. And um, so there wasn't as much threat from Spain against England as there had been 50 years before, but that animosity still existed. But there was value politically, just like there had been back during Henry VIII's day, <laughs> to have alignment between England and Spain politically, for political power reasons, not to mention all the stuff that's going on in the New World at this particular point in time, where Spain and Portugal are, for the most part, divvying up what we know as the Americas, but there is an English presence and there is a French presence. It's a really complicated couple of hundred years to be living through. So Charles the first is head of the Church of England. Why would Parliament want him to marry a Catholic? For the political, some in Parliament wanted him to marry a Catholic for the political alliance with Spain. So that they to, could fight Spain. No, to, so that they would not be fighting Spain and to counter France. Again, this is all about, okay. this is all about triangulation in, in politics. Spain and France were at each other to some degree, even though they were both Catholic because they had conflicting political interests on the continent. Again, not to mention what's going on globally in, in North America I was, and South America. Yeah, I was struggling because I was forgetting about France. So... I was so there's leaving a leaving a part of the triangle out. So I, I heard this term a couple of weeks ago and it stuck with me. We often talk today in modern context about geopolitics. This whole period of time could be described as theopolitics because there's theology going on with the politics, but those two things are all interplaying with each other. Alan, were there were there any provisions by Parliament about how they how uh, Charles and Henrietta would raise their children. You know, I don't remember. I don't remember hearing that, Doug. So I don't know the answer to that. I can presume the answer to that, and that would be was the expectation, obviously, that they would be raised in the Church of England. Yeah, I would think that'd be a very big deal. <laughs> right. Well, and in fact, it, this was this is c continued down until very recently. I think we talked about this uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um there were those who lost their place historically, including up until recently, in the English succession order if they were Catholics or if they were married to Catholics. I, th you know, I think Sherry can speak to this, but it's been only recently that it, it's become okay to keep your place in the line of succession if you are married to a Catholic. Is that correct? I think I've got that right from a conversation that I had with Alexis. Um, even that was not allowed, let alone obviously being one. So you know, here, here's the irony of the person who's holding the office married to a Catholic, uh, but yet later England will take the turn of you can't even be married to one and keep your line in, in the succession. But the other thing that confuses me is Parliament said they wanted him to marry a Catholic. He said, uh, you know, was it just a sp the specific, they wanted him to marry the Spanish Infanta person? And he said no to that, but then goes and finds somebody else Spanish to, it, what, what Kat, I mean, what, Catholic to marry? What Kathy is expressing is, I'll just sum it up. This is just Charles being Charles. There's all kinds of contradictory things. You heard Dr. Reeves say in there, you know, when you try to pin down what his real theological underpinning is, it's sort of a lost cause because he marries a Catholic, but then later supports Arminianism. Uh, I think the way that he described it, it seems like he, he basically chooses to do whatever he knows is going to stick it to his enemies at that moment in time the best. And the reason all of this is sort of important is what's going on in the back, again, again the backdrop here, this is the politics of it, but the backdrop is what? there's still dissension inside of the English church about exactly how Protestant they're going to be and what that's going to look like. And so you have the Puritan movement that's still going on at the same time of what's happening here. And spoiler alert, what's ultimately going to happen here is Charles is going to cause it to come to the point that they're actually, what happens in England is there's a period of time when there's no monarch. 
because of the forces that I'm talking about that come back and basically decide, I, I would argue because of Charles, to remove the monarchy, at least for a period of time. It's going to be restored, but that's the English Civil War. And that's the backdrop for much of what's going on. We come back and look at some of these splinter groups, the Pilgrims and the Puritans and others. That's the backdrop for all the things that are happening as Christianity is coming to the Americas in the various ways that it is with these various Puritan groups or with the crown. And it's also what's happening in terms of the continental settling at the end of the 30 years war here, which is we looked at as primarily religious in its undertone, even though it expresses itself in a lot of different ways. The last thing politically is Charles and Parliament go back and forth, back and forth over the issue of what's known as poundage and taxation. There were lots of liberties that Charles began to take in terms of how he accrued money for the taxation base there in England. By and large, the king had to ask Parliament for certain rights to tax certain things. Charles didn't like that, and at times he sort of went his own way and increased certain taxations and certain policies here and there. All the way until the beginning of the English Civil War, they're going back and forth on this. But don't say this is merely an issue of taxation, because the issue of taxation has at its root the issue of the king's decision repeatedly to do whatever he wants without any type of collaboration with the parliament or with the normal governing structures within England. You might say that Charles was an intensified version of his father. James talked incessantly about his own right and his own power, but James knew how to rule. He knew how to balance different sides against themselves and how not to hack off all the wrong people while doing so. Charles is not blessed with that type of grace. Well, that politics, that back and forth between Parliament and the King forms, again, the backdrop or the conditioning, you might say, of the religious fight that goes on during the English Civil War. A select number of people in England were getting a bit tired of Puritanism. They were tired of it not so much because they differed with it theologically all this time. As we've seen repeatedly, often they had the same theological principles, just different applications as to how the Reformed faith or the traditional Protestant faith was to live itself out in the context of the English church. Well, as alternatives to reform theology or wider Protestantism begin to emerge, a number of people begin to leverage this against the generic Puritan ethos there in England. During this time, in the early 1600s, there were a number of people who began to question and to doubt some of the basic principles of Protestant theology, namely some of the ideas associated with the doctrine of predestination. We'll look at this in a later lecture, but it is during this time that Arminianism comes on the rise in the Netherlands. Well, it doesn't simply affect enough. So as I mentioned, he's going to reference the fact that the, uh, what's happening here at the same time is the Dutch revolt in the Netherlands. And that is centered around, to a great degree, the, um, the contention between what had sort of grown into being the traditional reformed tradition, what we now label back as Calvinism, wasn't really called that in that day, and the rise of a challenge to part of that, primarily around the topic of predestination, which is Arminianism. So what you just heard him say there is an undercurrent of this political strife in England is also this theological clash inside of Protestantism. And part of the way it manifests itself is how aligned you are with what even then is not really called that, but we call it looking back Arminianism or the Arminian position. Does that make sense? Without getting into the diff without getting into what Arminianism is, which we are going to get into because it's an important theological place that we have to get. This is what the big part of what's going on theologically across the church during this 100 year period of time. But the two things are impacting each other. Any questions about that? 
Jones. In fact, the move away from more traditional Protestant doctrines begins to happen in England as well. A man by the name of Richard Montague was pretty viscerally opposed to the Puritan ethos. And he ended up writing a couple of books in which he argued that Anglicanism, or the Church of England, was not based on a traditional reading of Protestant doctrines, and it certainly wasn't, in his mind, anywhere close to Reformed theology. In other words, Richard Montague is a revisionist. He goes back and he pretends as if all the long heritage from Cramer on is a long interaction between all the various early Protestants as it evolved in Europe as a whole. Montague sees this as not the genealogy that he wants to see in his own church. And so he finds, he thinks, another one. One of the books he wrote was called A New Gag for an Old Goose in 1624. And another work he wrote, a very famous one, was called The Apello. In both of these works, as well as in others, Richard Montague does a couple of different moves. First and foremost, he mocks Reformed theology and the Synod of Dort. He says this idea of predestination or any of these other doctrines are cold and calculating and not biblical teaching. Let me put the context here because we haven't seen the other lecture yet. The Synod of Dort is a um, <laughs> is the meeting at which the question about um, um, Protestant okay. and can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Is where um, Calvinism and Arminianism clash with each other. So that's the backdrop there. And you guys are still able to hear the audio, correct? Yes. Okay. <laughs> he also then argues that the English church's theology... Oh, now I can't. He doesn't call it Anglicanism because that's not a word yet that's being used. But the English church's theology, the official state church's theology... Is not Protestant. It's more. I'm not hearing it now. Don't he I? argues that their church is more in keeping. You might. Say. I hear it. Oh, you do. I do. Oh, now I hear it. The traditional elements of the Christian life. Montague, in other words, is. I'm going to back it up a touch. I'm also going to do this really quick, which is I'm going to unshare and reshare just to get it straight. Zoom's not having a happy morning, obviously. Um, to share. So let me know if you can hear this when it starts. You does a couple of different moves. First and foremost, he mocks the form theology in the Senate of Dort. He says this idea. Can you hear it? No. Okay. This is really weird. This is going to drive me. <clears throat> I can, we can hear it, Don. Okay. Somebody else in chat, I don't know who it is, said that they weren't getting yeah, sound. They had logged in and not. I'm going to try to play a little bit more and then I'm going to take over from here just so we're not dealing with this. Okay. You know, predestination or any of these other doctrines are called. I can hear it now. And not biblical teaching. He also then argues that the English church's theology, he doesn't call it Anglicanism because that's not a word yet that's being used. But the English church's theology, the official state church's theology, is not Protestant. It's more ancient. He argues that their church is more in keeping, you might say, with the patristic witness. And therefore, it's more about liturgy than about more of the traditional elements of the Christian life. Montague, in other words, is either a bad theologian or a bad historian. <laughs> you see, because while his ideas might have appeal for some, then and now... This argument that Anglicanism had no real role to play and no real resources from Protestantism, and that it is just some genealogy from the patristic and medieval world, is simply made up out of thin air. And just to show this, the Commons there in London actually had Montague arrested. They arrested him for slandering the church and for slandering James, King James, who had now passed on. Some people scratch their head about this, but you have to remember, James had been trained by is real robust reformed Protestantism. It is an attack on the way things had been up until their day was just not to be tolerated. Now, this is in part those in commons who are themselves Puritan, let's say, using the political might to put the man down. 
However, at this point, Charles himself steps in. Once Montague is able sufficiently to release himself and to convince others that he is not Arminian fully, then Charles makes him actually a court chaplain there for himself. Now, the way Montague had convinced people is he wrote a preface to the 39 articles, the confessional standards there in the 17th century, as well as to the Book of Common Prayer, in which he argued that he did not intend to mean that he was Arminian. You see, because Arminianism had been thoroughly bashed, both in the Netherlands and to the applause of those in England. Many people found early Arminianism to be not the best ideas. A lot of this is aversion to Catholic talk of merit and good works, but there's also a political edge to a lot of this. So Montague would convince everyone that he's not an Arminian, which is probably true on some level. He doesn't seem to have really read Arminianism. His main argument was that Anglicanism was ancient and not really Protestant. But the important thing here is, is Charles... It's all really confusing, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not going to go down that as far because it, it will continue to go down the rabbit hole, but I want you to pick up on an important theme there, which is why I wanted to get through there. Montague was arguing what about the Church of England? That it wasn't really reformed. That it wasn't really reformed. He was even arguing that it wasn't even really Protestant. That it, that had, it was st still Catholic. Basically, not even that. Not because to say that they were to say that he was Catholic would have also brought down wrath on him. He was saying that it somehow it somehow had existed before uh, the Reformation. That it was yes, it contained reform <clears throat> ideas, but it actually predated the Reformation. Based on the historical, as, as I think Dr. Reeves pointed out very well, he's either a bad theologian, a bad historian, or actually he's a, he's actually bad at both because what do we know about the church in england before henry makes the decree in 1534 the act of supremacy it's very catholic it's very catholic <laughs> and in fact what what had henry been, the title remember that the title that henry had been awarded was defender of the faith why was he given the title defender of the faith what was what faith was he defending catholic, catholic. theology against <laughs> the, the early ideas of reform because he was going to be a priest before he before his brother dies and he's thrust into the position of being a king and so the thing i want you to pick up on here because we're actually going to come back to this later and i'm going to give it its hearing here <coughs> is this is not an uncommon thought that you see in a lot of the way that various theological systems are argued for for example in uh, trail of blood which is about the origin of baptists the argument is that is made is what that Baptists are not Protestants, but they they are an offshoot of the very true church going all the way back to the Book of Acts. This is a, this is a recurring theme for a lot of the various. I use the word sex, but I don't s e s s e c t s. I don't use that in a negative way. The various flavors of theological thought is that we are not breaking away from what is, we're just restoring what has always or should have always been. Does that make sense? <clears throat> yeah. There's this idea which is true in politics that's also true in religion. And I'm not denying that it doesn't have truth, but it's that I'm an originalist. We're just going back to what it always has been. We see this in American politics about interpreting, regardless of what side you are on an issue, we talk about what was the intent of the founding fathers in the Constitution. That gets to be an argument or a discussion because both sides want to claim that they are being true to the original intent. Everyone in, in these theological battles wants to claim that they're being true to what? The Bible. The Bible to scripture. <laughs> is that a bad thing? No. <laughs> that's what we, you know, we est we've established early on. That's what we all want to be true to. Um, so that is constantly what's happening here. So, for example, when we talked about the remember the Anabaptists, you know, deciding that the, the, the renouncing of infant baptism and moving towards credo baptism, what was their argument? 
this is the way it was in the early church. Their argument, I believe, particularly from my standpoint as a Baptist, is a true argument. But there were those who equally argue, and there is some evidence for this going back into maybe this, even as far back as the second and third century um, in history, that infant baptism was a longstanding practice of the church too. So if you turn the argument into which is older with older being better, that's how you get into a lot of these conflicts and you get into sometimes not being able to prove which came first. And so the reason I bring that up here now is that that's what I think should focus back to. It doesn't matter which came first. What matters is what? What does the Bible actually say about that? And where this comes into conflict with what we've studied here, that's the, that's the evolution of theology. And this is particularly true between Catholic theology and Protestant theology, is the Bible is there for both. But what is one of the primary differences between the Catholic view on <laughs> teaching and the Protestant view on teaching? What's the other thing that carries weight? Tradition, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't Montague making the same argument here? He's just making it as a Protestant? He's making an argument from tradition. Yeah. And so the reason I bring that up and something I'd like for just us to talk about here is, do we do the same thing in a modern sense sometime <clears throat> when we're looking at or defending our theological views? Do we sometimes appeal to tradition as often or as much as we appeal to scripture. Yes, people do that. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It can be good and it can be bad. That's right. I think the most important thing that I would suggest that we need to do is we just need to recognize when we're doing it and why we're doing it. If that tradition is founded in scripture, it can be a good thing to recognize this has been the traditional way of interpreting scripture by a large portion of the church for a long period of time. We actually have a word for that. We've used that word. That's called orthodoxy. And so tradition lends weight to orthodoxy and orthodoxy helps us understand that we're, you know, remember the, the, and now I don't have the slide here where I can easily get to remember the, the slide that I used. It was like the bowling lanes, keeping us between the gutters. Orthodoxy does a pretty good job of keeping us between the gutters and not doing something extreme. The danger of tradition is what? It can become too important. Right. And if the tradition actually is in contradicts or doesn't have support in scripture, we start relying upon the fact that we've always done it as the reason to do it, even if it contradicts scripture. And that's really what, at its core, at least to me, that's really what's going on here in all of the Reformation. You know, Luther, Luther reading scripture and going, what we're doing and what this says aren't the same thing. So if I've got to choose between tradition and scripture, what am I going to choose? Scripture. Scripture. That's, that's the doctrine of sola scriptura, right? We talked about. That's what's going on. <laughs> and the reason for me setting up this historical background, what ultimately is going to happen here, we'll pick this up probably next week, is Charles is going to be deposed as the monarch because of political things, but also because of how he's gone back and forth on these religious things, because there's there is distinction, but there's not distinction between religion and politics. And all of this is the backdrop for, we're talking here about the early part of the 17th century. This is the period of time when settlers are coming to our part of the world and they're bringing with them these ideals. So in some cases, folks like the pilgrims and others have fled actual persecution or perceived persecution, or they fled the fact that they can't fully exercise the way they would prefer to practice their religion. 
So for example, what is Charles doing here that it, it, even Dr. Reeves mentions this, that his father had done before? Who has the divine right? Who rules? He did. The king. We had not reached the point yet where there was a willingness, <laughs> although we're almost there. This is the English Civil War and they're going to depose a king. This idea that you could depose a monarch because you disagree with him, what does that come out of? That's a very Protestant thought. Yes. <laughs> we, in we inherit that in our political ethos as Americans. That I is that goes back to the concept, and I think this is from, from Martin, I know from, from Calvin, um, the authority derives from the office, not from the person. Correct. But but also, if you remember, the, the irony there being that in his later life, Calvin was essentially presiding over a theocracy in Geneva. Yeah. So, you know, I don't like absolute rule unless I'm the absolute ruler. <laughs> um, but this is part of what gets built into, and this is why I want to emphasize it here, because we're going to pick up on this theme is that this is what gets built into our modern <clears throat> theological ethos, but it's, it also ties into our modern political ethos in terms of the way these two things connect together. Does that make sense? Yeah. This is where the seeds of that continue to be sown. Um, no one would have dreamed Monarchs were overthrown all the time by other claimants to the throne. That's that's history. <laughs> Go back as far as you want to. Uh, everywhere, every nation, every place, there's been that type of conflict. But in the Christian world, the idea, even a hundred years before during Henry's reign, that you could remove the monarch on religious grounds was a concept that really didn't exist. That came into being as a result of the Reformation. That it was justifiable scripturally to remove what at that time was thought as being God's divinely appointed ruler. <laughs> so the result of that and how it plays out in terms of the denominations that we'll look at, Baptists fall into this category to a degree, but certainly others do as well. We saw this with the Anabaptists, if you remember back in the in the early um, 16th century uh, there in Switzerland. Remember, they weren't just about doing the, the rebaptizing. They were also about saying the city council had no right to tell them not to do it, right? There was both a, 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 a theological thing there that was being expressed, but that played out in a political context. And like it or not, we're going to have to, to navigate our way through this as we finish this thing up moving forward over time. Those two things now are both on the table side by side, and that's evidenced by the fact that the backdrop of this very time that we're talking about here, this thing with Montague and Charles I, is there's war all over Europe over religious concepts. That's the backdrop. Any thoughts about that? Questions about that? how the colonies actually survived. Well, and, and, and the colonies, if you know the history of the American colonies, they all come with very different reasons for their formation and foundation. Some of them were crown colonies. Some of them were independent uh, proprietary colonies. Maryland, for example, is called Maryland. Why? Because it's based off of Mary. It was founded during Mary's reign. Right. It's a haven for Catholics in the New World. Um, Roger Williams leaves um, the Massachusetts Bay Colony and goes a little bit south and forms Rhode Island. Why? Because he he is he's a he's essentially an early Baptist. Rhode Island is an is an early Baptist enclave. 
Um, yeah, but if 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 all of the stuff in England hadn't been happening, would so many people have been seeking refuge someplace else? Probably not for religious reasons. There would have been economic reasons. Economic reasons. But this is how this is how the United States is predominantly Protestant. And one of the reasons the United States is predominantly Protestant is that those that are coming from England during this period of time are primarily Protestant, various various elements of it, but are primarily Protestant in even though the Church of England is also Protestant. But it's these splinter groups that are inside the Puritan movements and the other groups that are primarily moving to the United States and they bring with them these thoughts. Right, but if England and Spain and France basically hadn't been struggling so much, maybe there would have been more effort. I mean, part of it is, is everything there in England is so close together. North America is, even though they had ships, it's still m much more further removed. It's hard for the king in England to necessarily keep up with everything that's going on just because of distance. And then there's so many different things happening over in this, in this colonies basically that even all of all of the people in North America at the time they weren't even agreeing I, I mean it's hard to believe that they had any any care about what was going on in North America because they were dealing with so much stuff there in England <clears throat> and to some degree that's true which is why freedom of thought theologically could be more easily expressed across an ocean right. than it could be across the street. And we inherit that heritage for everything good. And I would argue for the most part, it is good. <laughs> everything good that comes with it, but also potentially all of the things that come with that good. There's, there's two sides to that coin. You know, so my application question would be is, do we still deal with our struggle as, as, modern Christians in America with the role of our theological beliefs and how that interplays with, with politics? And the answer is yes, because we can't be totally divorced from our social and political systems and our, and our beliefs. It's still there, it's still present. <laughs> Questions, comments? Next week, we'll spend about five minutes fi finishing out Charles so you can understand what happens and how we get into the English Civil War. But what I really want to focus on next week, because it's been littered all through here, and it's a really important theological place to get to, because it is going to be something that carries down even to today, is we're going to pick up with an understanding about this debate between Calvinism and Arminianism. And we're going to understand how it historically comes into being, but we're also going to pick up on what the theology of that is. So we'll be going back, we'll be going back to theology, and there's a whole bunch of Bible verses that we'll be looking at because we're going to be looking at what they were looking at in terms of understanding primarily the argument is over one part of Reformed theology, which is over the concept of predestination. We're doing that even though it's Easter? Ooh, we'll do that the week <laughs> after Easter. Thank you. So what are we doing for Easter then? I don't know. I'll figure that out. Okay. Questions, comments? Sorry for the technical difficulties today. As a rule of thumb, uh, Zoom's been pretty nice to us for most of this past year, but it wasn't today. For just $67.
video as you want. Hi, hi, Bill, Doug, Donna, Diana. I see you all. Hello. Okay, I'm about to stop the recording so that Kathy can take over for.